Please don't politicize this virus. It exploits the differences you have at the national level. If you want to be exploited, and if you want to have many more body bags, then you do it. If you don't want many more body bags, then you refrain from politicizing it. My patience is long gone with the height of public ignorance, but it does, however, look like all the ignoramuses out there have finally crashed into the wall of public ignorance they themselves erected. That's all those people out there, particularly my relatives, that have for decades now dismissed any need to listen to any serious talk about what's going on in the grand scheme of things. The routine excuse has always been Why should I worry about all that stuff when it doesn't affect my life? So, here we are in the year 2020, and you should see yourselves all paranoid eyes ablaze with regimental government sanctioned social distancing hostility, scrambling around and hijacking toilet paper supplies and foraging for face masks. Funny how you folks never bothered to use your ears before to listen to all, all that, that stuff, stuff, but now it seems you've found a use for them. Now that all, all that, that stuff, stuff is affecting your life, maybe your parents oil will serve as a reminder that you have them. Your ears, that is. Yes, I'm talking to all you people that have always made it a point to ignore everything and never cared a monkey's fart to take anything seriously, whether it be within your own individual work surroundings or in the grander sense of things. Never saw any need to attach any vested responsibility or accountability to any of that stuff. Except now you can't deny that the blowback has cancelled out your feeble excuse that it doesn't affect your life because the grand scheme of things is now coming into full effect. And what has truly exhausted my patience is that despite the fact that it is now seriously affecting all their lives, especially the effects of this ridiculous shutdown, they still refuse to listen when urged to learn what's really going on and how the media is a criminal syndicate of brainwashing propaganda. They still don't listen and manage to tune out reality. And yet, unbelievably, they think they're being so socially responsible with their militant social distancing measures. Suddenly, it's all black and white now, and we need to take things seriously, and people need to listen up. Listen Where up, was their sober up, sense of serious social up, responsibility up, before all this up. happened? Hocus pocus, nowhere to be seen. See, see, Never took things seriously before, and still aren't really taking things seriously. Anyone that believes the media is not taking life seriously. As long as this sadistic relationship of ignorance remains fastened and fixed in orbit, the worst monsters of the world will be left unchecked to continue their ugly exploitation and destruction. And there's a stellar difference between ignorance and intentional ignorance. And the latter group must be on some kind of sedative that enhances their ignorance so that they can remain blissfully ignorant even after being informed. And that's the group I despise the most. All one has to do is browse the comment section on any of the mainstream media websites or YouTube videos or talk to people on the street, and one quickly discovers the dreadfully appalling level of public ignorance. It is terrifying. The level of public ignorance is absolutely terrifying. I know there are many people that wish I would push out way more video presentations, and I do understand that, but as I just noted, my patience with the public has gradually eroded to zero. For a while I wasn't sure if I would ever bother doing any more videos, short of one that's just unleashing an insurmountable wrath of rage. But when I did decide to sit down and start creating again, I saw a need to return to reflecting upon personal experience to provide some ballast to certain points in relation to real world context. So I guess you could say this video contains a splash of everything, including a healthy dose of rage.
We really have reached a tipping point here in history, and if people, by their own observations, can't see by now that the media is a deceitful information pathogen, then I suppose they never will. So I'm somewhat repulsed by this false sense of camaraderie and this idea that we're all in this together. No, we're not, because you people that believe the lies that the media monsters spew are facilitating the existence of the other monsters that are engineering these ghoulish master plans of Bedlam, and therefore you people are very much part of the problem. So we're not in this together, and you people should stop patting yourselves on the back and pinning social responsibility merit badges on your chest. And with the media, I get particularly enraged because it's their job to be at the cutting edge of truth, and they do the exact opposite. Quite some time ago, in book two of my Swamp Media Theater videos, I spoke at length about work ethic as our cardinal value, and one of the things I said was that if you don't care about your job, then you should remind yourself to spit on your food before you consume it in order to give it its proper value. But in cases like the media, where the carelessness in question isn't really carelessness, but intentionally deceiving and lying to the public to conceal and cover up the global atrocities perpetrated by the global puppet masters, it's an epidemiologist delight. spitting on their food isn't really sufficient. I suggest they defecate on their food before they eat it, because that's a closer equivalency to the subhuman malignancy their very existence represents. Such ugly, ugly people inside, gleefully getting away with their celebrity charade that they represent upstanding integrity bringing you the trusted news. It's so grotesque. I just can't imagine how these people can go home and kiss their loved ones after a day at work deceitfully telling the world a bunch of lies on national television. It's just so sick there aren't enough ugly words to wrap around it or enough bulkheads to quarantine its ugliness. Also, in the same aforementioned video, I reminisced on some of my employment chronicles and how I've been fired from several jobs. Not for being incompetent, mind you, but rather for speaking up about things I found to be alarming, I guess you could say. And I also reminisced on how over and over again I've seen how workers complain about work in lunchrooms or at home to their wives, but never speak a peep to the bosses or the owners of the company, or in an eggshell the source of the problem. But when I am speaking up to the source on the shop floor about those very things that are routinely complained about in the lunchroom, and sometimes getting fired in the process, all the lunchroom complainers suddenly busy themselves with their work and remain silent. Dead silent. Apart from the sounds of their newly found productiveness, of course. If there's one thing the majority of people can be relied on for, it's their silence. And because the majority are silent, the people who aren't routinely pay consequences. And if I do happen to be discussing my multiple estrangements from employment with someone, it's amusing to me how people like to try to play psychologist and parrot the old saying, Don't you know that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is the sign of insanity? <laughs> oh yes, that's right, silly me. I'm supposed to accept the first time as a lesson learned, then learn to keep my mouth shut thereafter, right? Not likely. I have to chuckle how people think they're psychoanalyzing while exposing their own weak character. It's the patented approach of attacking the very idea of having principles. They cackle and sneer that such an expectation is too tall an order, and in their stagely view, principles shouldn't be allocated serious consideration, especially at work. And certainly, anyone that would consider doing so consistently surely must be insane. After all, if you can't blend into that grey zone, you won't get anywhere in life. You won't look successful through the eyes of others. In order to normalize an unprincipled society, you must first brand the characterization of insanity onto those that won't behave like a plastic figure on a board game moving only in accordance to the role of the master's dice. With a central point being here that when I use these kinds of illustrations, I have more than just my computer keyboard backing up what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. And by extension, the scope of my financial lifeline has always been spiking turbulence. Except you can pretty much flatline those upper peaks as I've never been wealthy because I've never been able to stay up long enough to settle into any particular zone of comfort. So, with that said, to all those out there that are blaming everything on boomers, you can go jump in front of a quarter horse moving at full gallop, and I'll tell you why. Firstly, the submissive nature and silence of workers in the workplace has only increased. 
Now more than ever, people cling to their jobs because of the heightened social stigma to have all the latest phones and lattes. Or people are just so far in debt they avoid any conflicts of interest regardless of how they're treated. Secondly, the work ethic of our boomers period, in terms of quality work, was 50 times to what you millennial Facebook McAndroid misfits are capable of doing while you're bumbling around pulling up your pants with one hand and noodling with your stupid smartphone with the other. Air Canada is a good example where we see the effects of the overall deterioration of individual integrity. I knew someone quite well that worked for Air Canada for about a hundred years as the saying goes, and he'd be turning in his grave right now as the saying goes, because Air Canada used to have an honourable record and reputation. Now it's terrible with continuous infractions, baggage is thrown around on the ramp like garbage, and a routine takeoff seems to involve either wheels falling off or an engine on fire. It's an absolute disgrace. If the person I just spoke of were around these days, I've got a hunch he'd likely throw the workers in question off the ramp in the exact same fashion they treated the baggage. Perhaps you can see how this is now plugging into the bigger picture and our current circumstances because although the media and politicians are trying to champion all the doctors and nurses as courageous frontline heroes, they're not because they seem to lack the moral courage to speak up about all the lies and the overall egregiousness of what's unfolding on their watch in their wheelhouse, as the sayings go. And I keep saying that because you people have lots of sayings, but the ones used the most are the ones that champion nothing but silent resignation. Oh well, what can you do? You can't fight City Hall, you know. It's not a perfect world, you know. Things will never change, you know. And now I can officially respond to all the people that have sneered at me all my life. You can't change the world on your own, you know. And besides, look where it gets you. I can now say in kind, look where all your lack of individual action, silence, and overall ignorance has got us. Look how badly you've allowed the world to change, and consequently how badly it really needs to be changed now, with or without your help. That's if there's anything left to salvage after all this is over. Because, Eureka! Work ethic doesn't just mean quality work, it also means integrity. So again, why are there not thousands of doctors and nurses speaking out about all the lies and the giant criminal medical experiment that is transpiring with this bioweapon virus? We shouldn't even need to bring attention to the oath doctors take. They should be speaking up because it's part of their damn job to do so. They're highly obligated to. But they should also be speaking up because that's what a real human being would do. And if they're not going to do so, then I suggest they too should take a crap all over their food before they eat it. And given their silence, all the melodramatic ballyhoo about all the frontline heroes is nauseating to listen to. But we have seen a few doctors speaking out with some truth, among them being physician Dan Erickson and the controversial press conference he did. When I revisited my original bookmarked link to try to get the date of the press conference, it had been removed from YouTube. But as we now see, it's routinely getting removed. Many people have seen the video and its continual removal truly shows the ugliness of all this. So to begin with, let's revisit what physician Dan Erickson said at the very end of the video in closing and how the extraordinary context is hardly what you would expect coming from a physician discussing a virus. They are using this to see how much of their freedom can they take from you. And will you roll over and stay in your house? And it's working. And if you notice the way Americans are responding, if you go to any gun store in town, guess what they're out of? Ammo. None of them have ammo. I went to three of them. They said thousands of rounds have been bought. Why? People are mad. They're starting to post on my Facebook with their AKs going, let's roll. So what I'm saying is, let's avoid all that. Because if you, if you stomp on our freedoms, that has one ending, and it's violence. All right. Well, thank you, guys. You see, they didn't like his bottom line. They didn't like to hear a doctor telling it like it is. And throughout the entire interview, I noted that he repeated the statistic of, millions of cases, small amount of death, on four separate occasions.
But I would have to say the most significant thing he said while reflecting in hindsight to it all was that it's necessary that they implement measures, and I'm assuming he means constitutional measures, to ensure that something like this insanely absurd shutdown never occurs again. We also need to put measures in place so economic shutdown like this does not happen again. We want to make sure we understand that quarantine the sick is what we do, not quarantine the healthy. We need to make sure if you're going to, if you're going to depend on someone's constitutional rights, you better have a good reason. If you're going to dance on someone's constitutional rights, you better have a good reason. A good scientific reason. Yes, sir. And there's a whole lot of dancing on constitutional rights happening. And a whole lot of control. And it was highly disturbing to hear how deviously they're trying to manipulate the body bag count to spread fear and justify their social engineering actions. He looked straight into the camera when he said that, with a look that kind of says, the gig is up. And when asked if people are worrying too much, he responds, Yes, the filthy media, the filthy criminal media, and the flagship social media firewall and their scorched truth policy have torched Dr. Erickson out of the picture. And the same media hype has also wrought a self-satisfying desire in people to appoint themselves as some kind of home guard or social distancing patrol, going around and deciding who's putting lives at risk and who has blood on their hands and needs to be tried for murder. That's precisely the racket they're trying to lay on Trump. And when Trump opens up the country as it should be, I wouldn't put it past the sickos to selectively release another variant of the virus they have stuffed up their sleeve that will ensure to kill a whole bunch more vulnerable people, like the elderly, while they also target and terminate other people with an even more lethal strain, but just blame everything on a second outbreak. And then the media can pounce on Trump and call him a mass murderer that needs to be impeached. And we need to shut everything down again and quarantine indoors. Wait a minute, I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. One of the main reasons I still fully support Trump is that he's calling out the media for what it is. Fake news. They are the guardians of neither truth nor people. They are the enemy of the people and the guardians of crime and war, spitting on truth. In a way, you could say Trump is playing the only Trump card he really has, calling out the media for the joke that it is. I have pointed out before that Trump knows he can't come right out and spill the overall gruesomeness of what's going on because he knows there would be prompt and crippling repercussions on the stability of society. Much like how they've destroyed the economy with their little virus. All he can do is drop little hints and let the people do the rest. So in one way you could say that he's placing the responsibility into the hands of the people, which in reality is the way it should be. So by challenging the media, he's signaling to the American people that they're being lied to and they need to search out the truth and seek to be informed and essentially take their country back. If Trump was just as ultimately corrupt as the rest of Washington and didn't really want to help the country, he wouldn't be calling out the media the way he is. It's as simple as that, he just wouldn't be. Washington doesn't want to help the country. Trump does. The media doesn't want to help the country. Trump does. It's a pivotal point and difference. But they try to portray Trump's attack on the media as a fascist strong-arm tactic to censor the media. 
when in fact the reverse is true because it's the overall media conglomerate that is the strong arm doing all the censoring. But a large part of the problem is that droves of Trump supporters think his administration as a whole is a unified team, but they're most certainly not. And this is where Fox News is currently looking more ridiculous than the left-wing media because talking heads like Sean Hannity refer to Bill Barr as the new sheriff in town. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I would say that that overall misconception is the weak link that needs to be capitalized on. To be more specific, the left wing call Bill Barr corrupt largely because he's part of Trump's administration. And Bill Barr most certainly is corrupt, but nobody on the left or right is talking about the extent of his corruption stretching back to the cover-ups and wrist slapping of the MENA airport drug smuggling operation. The media don't want to go there, and that's a vulnerable area that the public need to wedge open and take advantage of. Or let's take the example I used in my opening. Let's go back to this Khashoggi. The fake news has done a swell job of avoiding the subject of yachts, and how long ago this yacht that belonged to this shadowy weapons merchant, Adnan Khashoggi, ended up getting sold to Trump. Although not directly, it was some kind of indirect sale. Incidentally, there's an old video on YouTube of Trump on David Letterman where they're discussing the purchase of the yacht. And in the clip, you can see that Trump is quite candid about the entire thing. But this miserable bitch here would just love to be blabbing about that past transaction with her sourpuss face of total condemnation. This one too. But they can't because their media overlords won't let them go there because for one, they know Trump is not involved with all the dark weapons for drugs and overall opium consortium and two, the whole weapons for drugs thing is the forbidden territory they like to keep in the shadows. And furthermore, it would destroy the bullshit narrative that Jamal Khashoggi was an innocent journalist and not a CIA cutout frontman to run guns and drugs and organize gangs. The bullshit narrative that Jamal Khashoggi was a guardian of truth. <laughs> when Jamal Khashoggi was allegedly killed by the Saudis, the media were very careful to tiptoe around the subject of Adnan Khashoggi, lest it let the cat out of the bag. It shows you how delicately they really are needing to tiptoe around things now. They've been getting away with this for so long and they've become pretty bold in their carelessness. Trump also wouldn't keep mentioning the deep state if he didn't want people to learn and know about it. Again, he's putting it in the hands of the people. He can't do everything. It's the people's country, and if they want to take it back, they need to accept the pearls he's casting and take it from there. The March 20th press conference was a good example of Trump being very revealing on a few counts. Among them was his theatrical mention of the deep state. Secretary of State Pompeo is extremely busy, so if you have any question for him right now, could you do that? Because you know what I'd like to do? I'd like him to go back to the State Department, or as they call it, the deep state department, you know, Mike. And the other was his disgruntled background remark to Mike Pompeo when Pompeo was yakking away and saying, we're in a live exercise. Whereupon Trump says in the background, with all intent to be heard, he should have told us. Mike, may, may, just, may just say one more thing. There, there's been some discussion about China and what they knew and when they knew it. And I've, I've been very critical. We, we, we need to know immediately. The world is entitled to know. The Chinese government was the first to know of this risk to the world. And that puts a special obligation to make sure that data, the data gets to our scientists, our professionals. This is not about retribution. This matters going forward. We're in a, we're in a live exercise here to get this right. We, we need to make sure that even to we and That's again a very subtle way he's telegraphing to the American people that he's dealing with people that are not telling him what's really going on and not really on his side. And you can tell by Trump's body language that he's not at all comfortable with most of the people he's surrounded by because he knows they're nothing but mad scientists percolating more than just lies. Speaking of which, there was the big Fauci facepalm thing that was widely circulated, but Fauci managed to weasel out of it by saying he was choking on a throat lozenge. And Trump retweeted this bimbo's tweet because he wanted to draw attention to it. And it truly amazes me how easy it is for them to sweep aside the words deep state as harmless or nutty conspiracy. In Canada, we have to listen to monsters like this spewing their lies twice, once in English and then again in French. But I really can't think of anything more grotesque than seeing a snake like this covering up and smoothing over acts of biowar perpetrated under the auspices of government against the public while speaking in a bedtime story time cadence.
telling you that this is the new normal and feeling anxiety is okay because he promises to be your savior that's going to keep you safe. Yuck. And I drew attention to the Winnipeg BSL-4 facility because the lab is involved in one way or another, whether in concocting and stealing things like at Fort Detrick or else to serve as a cover or distraction from Fort Detrick itself. Either way, there was a security breach at both labs, and the Canadian Chinese mad scientist and mad scientist Fauci go way back. The fiber of our country has now thinned to a point of financial decay and stinking corrupted rot. And as I've said before, many Canadians are under this misnomer that Canada is uniquely innocent and set apart from all the really ugly stuff going on. Wrong. And it's so wrong, because in a way, things all began in Canada at Camp X, where through the SOE, the OSS was first established. The OSS then morphed into the CIA. And when you look at the history of the Allen Memorial Institute, you see that Canada is no stranger to the Frankenstein creepiness. And with Allen Memorial being affiliated with McGill University, Trudeau is sort of like a groomed test tube exhibit. It's an epidemiologist delight. Many more body bites. It's an epidemiologist delight. I mean, if you want to, if you want to specialize in epidemiology, you just got to read this. And you, if you have any children you want them to go into epidemiology, tell them the SARS story. They'll all go into epidemiology. There is no question that there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the arena of infectious diseases, both chronic infectious diseases in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we have certainly a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. 